And this sense of rootedness was also reflected in the way Jews thought of their cities. Vilna is an example. Uh, Vilna Jews had this enormous pride in the centuries-old traditions of their cities. When they talked about the great Vilna Gaon, uh, the, the, the uh, Gra, as uh, he was called, they reminded you that when the Vilna Gaon lived in Vilna, and his dates are 1720 to 1797, uh, there were 333 Jews in Vilna who knew the Talmud by heart. So to be a Gaon in Vilna was something. You know, if you could make it there, you could make it anywhere. Uh, and there's a story how when the children would follow after the Vilna Gaon and they would yell, Ot geiter Vilna Gaon, not geiter Vilna Gaon. The Vilna Gaon is, is going in, in the street. He would turn around to them and say, Vilna Kinder, veterich sein Agon. Kids, if you only want it badly enough, you could also be a Gaon, a, a genius. And Vilno, if you want it badly enough, is a pun on the name for Vilna. Uh, the Vilna Jews also had a story about the provenance, about the origins of their famous uh, central synagogue, which was built in the late 16th century. And the story goes that when this gorgeous synagogue was built, the Karaites claimed it for themselves. And the uh, dispute went to the local uh, Polish governor uh, who called in a representative of the Jews and a representative of the Karaites to argue their case. And the Karaites told the Polish governor, we are the true Jews, we are the real Jews. Uh, we follow the Bible and, and not this mumbo jumbo of the Talmud, and so the synagogue should go to us. And the representative of the Vilna Jews came in, Moshe, and when he addressed the Polish governor, he tied a uh, shoes around his neck. And they looked at him and said, why are you appearing with shoes tied around your neck? And Moshe said, well, when Moshe Rabbeinu, when Moses went to Mount Sinai to get the Torah, he left his shoes at the foot of the mountain, and Karaites stole the shoes. And the Karaites said, you idiot, when Moshe got the Torah at Mount Sinai, there were no Karaites. And Moshe then turned to Rajaville, the Polish governor, and said, you see, how could they claim they're the true Jews if, if there were no Karaites at Mount Sinai? And the legend goes, that's how the Jews kept the Shtutschul, and that's how the great synagogue court uh, was able to flourish and develop in Vilna. These are examples of legends and stories which show that the Jews, in bad times and in good times, felt at home in Poland. Now, why Poland? A combination, you might say, of politics, geography, economics, culture. Uh, first of all, Polish kings, kings like Casimir the Great in the uh, 14th century, kings like Zygmunt I and Zygmunt II uh, in, in uh, the 16th century, were kings who reaffirmed promises of toleration, uh, promises of uh, autonomy. And it wasn't just this tradition of tolerating Jews. Uh, the Polish Commonwealth was very, very anxious to avoid the debilitating religious wars and persecution that had so paralyzed other European societies. And so there was this extra effort to uh, try to uh, allow for many different peoples, many different religions to live in peace. Now, that, as we know, was not always the case, and sometimes there were very bloody persecutions of Jews and of others. But nevertheless, this was the ideal. This ideal of toleration was perhaps more embedded in Polish political tradition than in the traditions of most other European countries. Now, another reason why Poland became 
uh, such an important country for the Jews was the critically uh, vital role of the nobility. The nobility had more power in Poland than in any comparable European country. For laws to be passed in the Polish parliament, it required the consent of the nobility. By the late 16th century, the Polish monarchy becomes an elective monarchy. The kings are elected by the nobles. Now, the nobles are about 7, 8 percent of the population. So you might say that uh, they, uh, who were, who had the vote, they formed a kind of a democracy, that Poland was kind of a republic where 7 percent of its population was able to take part in the political life. Now, if you were a serf, things weren't so good. But uh, the nobility, as I said, uh, had enormous political power and it owned most of the land. Now, the Polish Commonwealth, especially the eastern part of the Commonwealth, and what is today Belarus and Ukraine, was vast and greatly underpopulated. And many of these Polish nobles looked at that land that they owned and asked themselves, how can we turn that land into money? Those forests, uh, those fields, uh, how can we uh, turn those forests into lumber, which can be sold to Holland, England, France, and Spain to build the huge navies, which they needed to trade with the New World? How can we ship uh, grain to European cities? Uh, Europe needs our salt, of which we're the greatest producer. Uh, Europe needs our honey and our amber. Uh, and in return, we will use that money to buy consumer goods. And uh, we will also take advantage of the fact that nature, Mother Nature, gave Poland a perfect interstate highway system, the best in all of Europe. It was called the rivers. Poland, except in the south, was a flat country. And it was crossed by many, many rivers and tributaries, which emptied into a few big rivers, like the Vistula and the uh, Divina and the Nieman. And ports like Danzig became the great centers of Polish trade with the outside world. 